one of our pre-health advisors, Ms. Harriman Williams, come and talk about um, you know what you want to look for in terms of applying to med schools and what services uh, her office provides. So we're going to turn it over to her. Please be attentive and ask any questions you might have. Well, thank you, Matt. So again, my name is Harold Williams. I'm pre health advisor here. I've been here for approximately two years. Uh, the 20th was my second year anniversary, so whoop whoop to me. Um, I'm down in 106 Oldman, um, so that's the student services office. So if you guys need to come, make an appointment to see me. Um, the number down there is 775-3180. Uh, and so I'm there most of the time. Please come see me. Um, when we kind of go through the process, you'll understand why you will need to see me. Okay? So um, most of you guys, um, like she said, about 70% plus may be interested in getting into the health profession. And so that's essentially what I'm here to talk about. If you guys have the right secret sauce. Um, so first, I kind of want to know who's in the room, who I'm dealing with, the audience, okay? So um, by show of hands, I would like you to let me know uh, what health profession you might be interested in. So um, my pre-meds, where are they at? Raise them high. Okay, all right. So then I'll follow it back behind, which usually you guys don't know which one to go, my PAs some double hands possibly. Okay, dentistry, beautiful. Chiropractic, what? We need to snap no necks and backs. And... Okay, uh, occupational therapy, OTs, PTs. All right, I will bet you some of my PTs will probably end up as OTs. Okay, at the end of it. Um, optometry. Opt all these glasses and contacts around in here, nobody wants to be an optometrist, seriously? Oh, okay, all right, well, let's see. Um, podiatry. I know we have one podiatrist in the room. One foot doctor. You really don't realize how much money that they make, <laughs> especially just to deal with somebody from the knee down. I'm telling you. Okay. Uh, and then uh, vet. We have any puppy lovers, all right. Horses and goats and squirrels and whatever else we have. Okay. And then uh, last but not least, do we have any pharmacists? Oh, it looks like we got one drug deal, two drug deals. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, wonderful, wonderful. Okay. Oops. Okay. So, rule of thumb, usually one of the first things you guys come and ask me, um, especially if you want to go into health professions, is what major should I pick, Ms. Harrowin? Um, I, you know, I want to go straight through, I want to be an orthopedic surgeon, and I want to go to Yale, and I want to do this and that and the other, and I'm like, okay, cool. Um, so yes, traditionally, um, most students will do biology. The reason that they do biology is because all of the required courses for the majority of the health professions are within a biology degree. So a lot of students will come to me and say, what's the quickest way, what's the easiest way, whatever it may be, and usually, I'll say biology has everything included, but I'm not going to say that it's the easiest way, okay? Now, when I say this, um, not to take anything away from biology at all, because I love our biology department, but the major doesn't matter, okay? So that's the bigger thing I usually try to get students to understand. The major that you pick has nothing to do with if you're going to be a good or a bad doctor. The point is, if you're able to do the prereq requirements that they're asking for you to do and do it at a high level, um, and then, of course, the other steps that we'll talk about later, then you have a very good shot of getting into your health profession of choice, okay? So that's the bigger thing. Usually, I tell students, pick whatever major that you want and make sure that you can keep your GPA up in it and realize that your bachelor's degree is your fallback plan. So if we don't make it into medical school or health profession school or PT or whatever, then we have to like our major to some degree because then we might have to go get a master's or a doctorate or something like that in it in order to move forward if health professions does not work out for you. Okay, so be very mindful of the major that you pick. 
Um, you know, if you like it, you know, make sure that you're going to love it if something doesn't happen. Um, usually students will try to get into their health professions between one and three times. Okay, so don't be discouraged if you don't make it in your first time. Um, a lot of times what ends up happening, first time students don't listen. They think they know everything and so I'm getting myself. Second time they usually come back and they're like, oh, I'm humbled. Please help me get in. Okay, and then usually they get in. And then the third time is normally, it could be something about the cycle that you were going through, the, the application cycle. Um, I remember when the new MCAT about two years ago came out, um, students, we were kind of, everybody was kind of all over the place because we didn't know what to tell students, what to shoot for as far as MCAT scores, um, what a 500 looked like as opposed to a 30. You know, we weren't sure of all of that. And so a lot of students um, felt like, they may have gotten the shortage of the stick, um, but that happens a lot of times. Like last year, I think that there was also a shortage of uh, um, family practitioners. So a lot of the students who went in stating that that's what they wanted to do, um, more of those students went in because we do have that national shortage of it. So there's usually different things that might dictate the application cycle and those kind of things. But for the most part, if you go in and you're prepared and you listen and you respect the process, then normally you don't have a problem getting in. Okay? So. Um, this is going to be pretty much the four years of study, um, pretty much based on a biology degree, but this is pretty much just set up for the prereqs that you're going to be needing for most of the health professions that you decide to go into. Um, since most of you guys in here are pretty much second year and above, um, then we're past the reflection stage. We're past that stage of, am I in the right major, am I doing the right things, kind of thing. You're now on the track that you want to be on. And now we have to make the most of that track that we're on, okay? And so the bigger thing is what usually students will come to me in their junior year or senior year or they're getting ready to apply. They have no shadowing. They have no volunteer. They have none of that kind of stuff. And then they're trying to scramble around and they're trying to uh, do things and find things instead of trying to incorporate this as they're going through. Like I tell my students all the time, four years is a long time and a short time in the same breath. And if we're going to break it down, we're breaking it down to eight semesters you're going to be here. Okay? So within eight semesters, you've got to get things right about what you want to do, what you need to do, and how you need to accomplish it. Okay? And so if anything I tell students to start right now, you're already doing the work. So it's not about the coursework. Let's get past that. You're not at a point right now, and some of you may be, okay? Um, you may be at that point where you're getting ready to start with MCAT prep or that kind of thing. And that's fine, okay? But it's not about just being the smartest person and it's not about having the highest MCAT score. Because I can tell you I've seen many students that have all of that and not seen a doctor, not shadow, not volunteer, not get into the pre-health society, not get into maps, not do anything, and do not get in. Because it's about you being a well-rounded individual. Okay? You have to realize, going into the health professions, you're going to be dealing with people who don't look like you, think like you, and talk like you. And you have to tell them, sometimes, very bad information. And you have to be able to handle it yourself by pushing that information forward. And you have to be able to handle how they're going to respond back to you. Okay? So that's where their maturity comes. So a lot of times I have my students that are coming in, oh, I need to finish in three years. I need to hurry up and get out. Hurry up and get out for what? For you to rush back into school? Because that's what you're doing. You're trying to hurry up and finish this bachelor's degree just to hurry up and rush into get into your health profession. And if you don't do quality things and participate in quality experiences, you're not going to be a quality health professional. That's the bigger thing of it. Okay? So don't look at the shadowing and the volunteering and that kind of stuff as a secondary, a pain. You know, why do I need to know this? Why do I? It's so good to know because you could go shadow someone and realize, oh, this ain't even what I want to do. So now I've spent all my effort and energy pushing to something that I said I want to do, and all I needed to do was go shadow and volunteer for a couple hours, go ask some questions of some people, and figure out, I don't like this, let me go another path. And I'll tell you, a lot of students will just keep going down that path. I don't want to disappoint my family. I don't want to do this, and I don't want to do that. You're the one that's going to have to live with it. And so you need to make sure that you're going to be prepared. Think about this. You're in college for us to prepare you for what you want to do for the rest of your life, correct? So why do you want to rush it? Why do you want to push it through? Do you want to go to a doctor that has a C plus? Do you? 
So why do you think it's okay for you to get a C plus and I'll just shuffle it off to something else? I'll do better the next time. Well, what is that C plus with some information that they need in order to help you to move forward? So think about that that way. If you don't want anybody dealing with you on that level and they're not academically where they need to be, then why do you think that it's okay for you not to be academically where you need to be? Okay? So, as we go through, we'll talk about our letters of recommendation. Um, of course, shadowing volunteering. If you guys are not a part of the uh, email listserv that we have, please go on to the pre-health website and sign up for it. Um, we've got jobs that come through for the summer. We've got summer programs. We've got shadowing opportunities. We've got all, so all the things that you come to our office and you ask us about, okay, in private, this is stuff that's already out there, okay? Um, and then as we're getting close to getting ready to graduate, making sure we have our degree requirements, because you're doing two things at once. You're getting your bachelor's degree, and you're trying to prepare yourself for your secondary, whatever that backup plan is. At the same time, you're trying to do your required courses in order to move forward into your health profession. So you have to think about all that stuff that you're doing, and you have to be able to coordinate that. You know, so you're cheating yourself, you know, if you don't think that these little bitty workshops or whatever is important. You're really cheating yourself in the, in the bigger picture, okay? So, this is what the application cycle looks like, okay? And this is the traditional application cycle. So this means that if I'm going to, uh, in my third year, start the process, so then by the time I graduate, that next fall cohort that's going to be starting, I'm going to be in it. This is traditional. Now, all of this can change depending on what you have done or what you don't have done. Um, like I'm saying, um, a gap year is very important. You know, medical schools don't look at students or either any health professional schools don't look at students like, why'd you take a year off? Why'd you take a gap year? Why'd you, you know, they don't ask that. They want to know, do you have the appropriate prereqs? Do you have the appropriate MCAT or GRE or OAT or DAT or whatever score? And then what have you done to kind of open your eyes within the field you say you want to be for the rest of your life, okay? And so normally it'll be third year, spring semester is when we'll start prepping for whatever professional test that we need. And we'll kind of go through to see what test is needed. But if that's MCAT, if that's GRE or what have you, um, then that would it be. Um, MCAT is the monster. The reason it's the monster is because all of the information that is on the MCAT is based on the courses that you're taking right now. So your biology, your chemistry, your biochem, physics, all of that is the information that's going to be on the MCAT. So you have to remember it, throw it back up, write it back on your test, okay? Whereas the GRE, what the GRE is, I would liken that to an advanced ACT, okay? So you guys remember a couple years ago, y'all might have took the ACT, a little bit of math, a little bit of reading, writing kind of thing. That's pretty much what the GRE is. I would say the worst part of a GRE, most students come back to me and they say, you know, Ms. Harold, I, I wish I would have felt like I would have read the dictionary before I took the GRE. And that's how extensive the vocabulary is. So they give you these crazy words <coughs> and these crazy supercalifragilistic paragraphs, okay, and then they want to see how you can critically think through that. And so that's the hard part. Um, they've got GRE apps out. Many of the students are coming to me saying they're using Magoosh. Um, we have a GRE prep course um, that we usually run um, at the end of spring semester um, and before summer semester starts. So I'm starting to put that together. So students who want to use the GRE prep course that we have, it runs $200. Um, that's books and instruction that you get by a grad level student. Um, and then most students who do participate, who have participated, um, they've increased their score with a prep course by six to ten points, okay? So that's huge, all right? So that's pretty much the majority of the, or the major tests that you'll need as you're going through your health professions. So that's what's going to be the prep that we're going to do pretty much spring semester. Then we're going to get to um, summer semester where we're actually going to apply to our what we call CAS services, C-A-S, okay? Central Application Service. All of the medical um, or health professions have a CAS service or application that you <coughs> put your information into, okay? And so after you end up doing that, there's gonna be several different things that you need to make sure that's in that application. Every transcript that you've taken, 
So if you did PSEO or AP or whatever at another institution, a community college, anything, they need every single transcript of every single college class that you've ever taken. Okay? Then the next thing that you'll need is a personal statement. So why do you want to do this? Why medicine? Why PA? Why PT? They're going to want to know that. And then I'll tell students if we had any crash and burn moments. So you know what those are. You know, grandma died or the cat got ran over and you had a bad semester or bad two, three semesters. And then you're trying to make it up. Okay, those are the crash and burn moments. In our personal statement, we have to be very mature about if we have those. And then, if I did have it, why did I have it? And what did I do to change that around? Okay? They're going to want to know that because they're going to see the transcript sitting in front of you. So you can sit there and, you know, den sit in denial all you want to, but they're going to be like, well, what was the straight S for for two semesters straight? What went on? Why didn't you drop the classes? Why didn't you do whatever? So you're going to have to be mature enough to have an explanation for that as well. Okay? And then, one of the bigger things is your letters of recommendation. Okay? Um, average, usually between three to four. Um, I usually ask for students maybe to do five or six because people who write letters of recommendations for you, they mean well, but that doesn't mean they write good. Okay? And if you only give me three letters and one of your letters suck, you know, what, what am I going to do? And then you're waiting at the last minute, you know, I need to do this. I need to, oh my God, I got to get this letter in. My application's been submitted. I am, and you will get all over the place really quickly, okay, especially when that application cycle starts. So we'll talk a little bit more about the letters of recommendation and what that looks like, but you're going to need whatever health profession you are, you need a professional in that field to write you a letter to vouch for you, to say, yeah, I think they would make a good one. You know, I see they work well with patients. I see that they have, you know, good conversation, empathy, that kind of thing. You need someone to talk with in that profession, okay? So, Siebert and Rattucci, that's teaching your anatomies and all that kind of stuff. Turnbull, who just left with OCHEM, you'll need those as well because they'll need to have science professors writing your letters. But they're not the kind of doctors, PhD doctors, that we want to see letters from with the shadow and the volunteering. Okay, so you need to make sure if you're doing a PT, get a PT letter. Okay, if you're doing PA, get a PA letter. If you're going to medicine, you need two letters. You need an MD letter and you need a DO letter. Okay, and I'll tell you, I understand that students are like, I don't know to do this here. In the bigger scheme of things, nobody cares about the last two letters of your name. They don't care if it says MD or DO. They care if it says doctor, DR. Dr. Harrelin, how are you going to help me? I, nobody's going to come and say, oh, you're a DO? Mm. Let me go over here and find somebody else. There. Nobody's going to do that. So, you know, you increase your chances by applying to both. So we usually tell you to apply to both. And you need to talk to both those type of doctors to find out if this is what you like. Okay? So then we go down here to fall semester. Fall semester is usually going to be interviews. Okay? So that's going to be yes, no, and wait listed. All right? We know what yes, no means. Waste listed pretty much means that they think that you're a very valuable, competitive student. Once the other students decide where they want to go and fall off the rolls, then you'll move up and wait list. Okay? I think worst case scenario, I heard a young man, and this was just recent, um, a young man uh, got off the wait list the day before medical school started. And if it's the day before, are you going to say, no, give me a week? No, you're going to go, right? We waited all this long, okay? <coughs> so after interviews, we'll come down to graduation. That's going to be first one of the most important parts. You cannot be any kind of health professional without a bachelor's degree, okay? So do your best to do good in that first, all right? Then we'll come summer, but it's usually that fall um, that most cohorts will end up starting. Um, you know, they might bring you in early, sometimes in July. Um, you know, for orientations and different things, but that's pretty much what this application process looks like, and it's the same every single year. So, to give you an idea of maybe the dates, um, PA, which is CASPA, that opened um, last cycle, April 22nd, okay? Um, the medical school, MD and DO, that opened this last cycle, May 4th, okay? Um, PT uh, opened probably around June 30th, something of that nature. Okay, so that's what you're roughly looking at. 
And so usually when I'm telling students, and we're kind of going through the application cycle, we don't care about deadlines. And what I mean by that, if you're sitting up here looking at a school that you want to go to, and you are so concerned about when the deadline and when this application is due, then you're already behind the game. Okay? That's not going to work. When the application opens is when it matters. So I said CASPA opened April 22nd, then you need to be April 22nd sitting in front of your CASPA, putting your information in, submitting it. Okay? That's how that needs to go. The later you wait, the longer or the lower you are on the pile. Okay? So example would be Boonshaw had 5,100 applicants this last cycle for 116 spots. So if you want to wait until you don't wait until the last minute to get your shadowing done sometime in August, September, and then submit your application, okay, you probably won't ever hear from anybody. And they'll do that. I mean, medical schools, you can send out 20 different applications and you won't hear nothing from one of them, especially if you didn't do what you're supposed to do correctly. That's just the nature of the beast. You know, you have to look at it as, um, all these health profession schools are uh, exclusive clubs, okay? And these clubs try to do anything possible to keep you out until you learn how to play the game. And then when you play the game and you do what you're supposed to do, talk to the right people, take the right tests, network, that kind of thing, then you're rewarded by being allowed in. So that's kind of how I try to get you guys to look at it. There's never a silver bullet. There's never anything to say, Tell me exactly what I need to say and exactly what I need to write and exactly the activity that I should participate in in order to make this happen. And I can't do that. Because I can tell you, I just got a shot, you know, a young lady I found out, she applied to one medical school because that's all she wanted to go. Barely had any shadowing, but she made it in. So what I probably say is how it worked for her. Yes, she had a 4.0 GPA. She had a decent MCAT score. One of the things I say is probably she had probably had a good gift of gab when she got into that interview, and let them know, you know, even though she was deficient in this, this is where she was greater in. When she made it in, you know. So that kind of goes against all the stuff I'm pushing to you. Do this, do this, do this. Shadow this. Volunteer this. But she was that unicorn in the bunch. You know, that usually doesn't happen to many folks. Okay. So as we talk about respect the process, and it, that's exactly what it is, okay? And so you're gonna need us way sooner before we need you. And what I mean by that is, you're gonna need us to help you with your letters. You're gonna need us to possibly collect your letters. You're going to need to maybe come talk to us about options, alternatives. That's what we're here for. And to walk past the office continuously knowing that we're here and we have that service, you're doing yourself a disservice. Okay. So just quickly, these are going to be some of the things that they look for. They're going to look for the prereq courses that you've taken. Okay. What, did you grade, what, what was the grade that you got into them? Now, I do have my overachievers, my 4.0ers, you know, and that's wonderful. And sometimes they come in my office and break down it because they got a C. You know, C's are okay. Medical schools don't take many, but they will take a C here and there. Okay, so it's okay. Um, the bigger thing of all of this is, am I showing that I'm doing uh, a rigorous schedule? Am I showing that I can handle, if this was now flipped and I was in medical school, could I be able to handle this? You know, I, I sometimes ask my medical school students or even any health profession, honestly, how they feel when they're in medical school or PT school, and they say it feels like they're drinking from a fire hose. So just imagine you're trying to take a fire hose, flip it on yourself, and swallow back that water, okay? That's you trying to take all that information Take it in, process it, and shoot it back out on a test or whatever that may be. And if you're not conditioning yourself to click on all those cylinders as you're doing your bachelor's degree, then by the time you do make it into medical school, you won't be successful because the pressure will be too great. You won't know how to, you know, turn your legs over. I wouldn't go out here and run a marathon, 26 miles, and I can barely walk up the steps without getting winded. So that's how, you know, each semester add on something a little bit more. Take on 
you know, another project, community service, you know, help out tutor, any of those things become one of the things we talk about the different certifications. I usually tell students, get a STNA, CNA, State Tested Nursing Assistant, uh, Certified Nursing Assistant certification. Get medical scribing. We have a medical scribing class that's here. Um, it works in collaboration with ABC Scribes. Dr. Quietech is the owner. Um, he's an emergency room doctor over at uh, Rise Zone. Many of the students who complete that course, they end up working as a medical scribe. <coughs> Many of those medical scribes are now in medical school. And so usually what I say is students will realize that they can't work and get the good grades that they want to do and do the shadowing and all that kind of stuff. And so the reason why I push the certifications is, you know, if you want to be a doctor, let's play doctor. Let's get certifications. Let's get all these different things. So then when you do become a doctor, you'll be a better doctor. A lot of the doctors that they don't know how to draw blood or different things that, of that nature because they didn't have those skills. So think if you're coming with an STNA or coming with a phlebotomy certification or something like that. That is part of your secret sauce. That's part of the things that's going to make you stand out past everyone else. And a lot of times what happens, if you're working over at Old Navy or Sonic and you, you know, passing out shakes, it's hard to understand how old chemistry or general chemistry is then going to connect to that. You know, whereas if you're being a scribe or if you're working at STNA, you know, I can see acidosis in this chemistry equation, now acidosis in the body at the hospital. Okay, so that's how you try to make that. So you can make money, get your shadowing, get your experience, network with doctors and other health professionals that you're working with. If this is what you want to do, why would you work at Old Navy knowing that you want to cut somebody's leg open? Okay? Extracurricular activities. So, participating in MAPS. Okay? Um, Multicultural Association for a Pre-Med Student. <coughs> Pre-Health Society. Participating in that. You know, summer programs. Uh, SMDEA, uh, wait a minute, hold on, let me get my letters together. SMDEP, which is now SHPEP, is a summer health uh, research program that a lot of students can get their research in. You know, especially if you want to do medicine, MDDO. You know, if you want to apply to like UC or if you want to apply to Case Western, if you don't have any research, don't waste your time applying because they're heavy research institutions. And if you don't have that, then you're going to be deficient. And they don't want students who don't have that background. So, you know, that's another thing added on. Now it's, i got to get a 4.0. i got to get, you know, an MCAT score that's out this world. And then I have to turn around and get shadowing. And then I have to turn around and get research. Okay? So these are all the things they're going to look at. You know, like I have one young man. He's an Eagle Scout. Okay, he participates with his community, with his uh, Boy Scout um, uh, troop. You know, that's giving back to the community. Those are things, that, that's empathy, that's service, that's what health is about. You know, so it's not specific things that I can tell you to do. It's how are you going to make your city, state, community great? What are you going to do to help folks? And that's the big thing, okay, when it comes to activities. And then, of course, we got our secret sauce, and so those are all the extra things that we're bringing to it. I got one young man, and he's been working since 2011 down at the community blood bank. And now he's an avid blood donor. And I told him, I said, I would have never thought about giving no blood. You know, I mean, me personally. But that's something that would be awesome in his personal statement. This is something that has taken him to a level that he feels is important. Now he's an avid participant in that. And so that's a wonderful reason as to why he wants to go to medical school. He wants to spread that knowledge. Okay? So those are the kind of things. You don't have to be, have that spectacular story or that tear-jerking story of, you know, I fought childhood leukemia and was able to come through and now I want to, you know, help the masses. You know, not everybody has that story. But the story that you do have, you need to make that a good story. Okay? So these are what the applications are and the tests that you need to take for the different health professions, okay? So like I said, for medicine, we have MD, doctors, and DO. So there's two different applications, AMCAS and APOMIS. Um, everybody needs the MCAT, okay? Then we've got pharmacy, PharmCAS with the PCAT, 
PT CAS for physical therapy and the GRE, occupational therapy, uh, um, the uh, OT CAS. Now, differences, uh, Ms. Port, physical therapy, kind of what the difference is, okay, between them. So academically, what the difference is between OT and PT is chemistry. So, chemistry is the devil, we know it, all right? And most students will come to me and say, I hate chemistry, I don't want to do it again, but I still want to be in some kind of therapy, what's it going to be? I'm going to tell you to go to occupational therapy. That's, you know, how it is. Now, the difference between, I say, career, why would be, um, okay, I break my leg, okay? And then I need to go to a physical therapist in order to get my leg back before pre-injury, okay? And so what I end up doing then at that point is that physical therapist is going to help me rehab to be able to walk around before pre-injury, all right? But then I go to an occupational therapy because now I'm finished with the, the PT, now I need to go to the OT because now my broken leg may be healed crooked and I've got a limp and now it's hurting my job and now I can't work effectively on my job. And so then the OT is going to come help me find ways to accommodate so then I can be successful on my job or successful at home. You know, if I need to stand there and cook dinner for my kids and my leg is all crooked and I'm tired, then the OT is going to come in and going to help me find ways so I can finish my hamburgers for my babies. Okay? So that's kind of the difference between the two. Now, OT is now a doctorate program. So um, it kind of made the same transition that PT made with going from a master's program now to a doctorate. So it's going to be a three-year program for uh, PT and OT as well, if students are interested in it. So that's kind of what that difference looks like. All right. Then our next one's BIMCAST is our application. Um, uh, vet schools will take either GRE or MCAT. Take the GRE. No reason to take the MCAT if you're going to vet school, especially if they want the other one. It's like, don't kill yourself. You know, it's not worth it. Okay. Um, optometry, um, dentistry has a funny one, ad ass. Um, that's the <laughs> application. Um, the DAT, then CASPA, and the TRA. Okay. So, medical school, what you're looking at, or any of the health professions, four years, so that's what we're here doing now. Um, if you're going to do uh, PT, I mean uh, PA, which is um, the only one right now, I need to flip OT out. Um, but there are still some master's programs for OT. Okay, but this is what I'll say. Why would you waste your time in a master's program for OT and somebody younger than you, than you is going to come back and get the doctorate and then be your boss? So why would you do that? If it's available as a doctorate, do the doctorate. Okay? Um, then optometry and everything else is pretty much going to be four years after your four years here, your bachelor's degree. And then medicine is going to be pretty much one to seven, depending on what kind of doctor you want to be. So you're not going to have mo a lot of residencies if you're going to do um, like uh, primary or family medicine or those kind of things, as opposed to if you wanted to do, let's say, internal medicine or uh, um, um, surgery, orthopedic surgery or plastic surgery, that you're going to be there forever trying to do that. Okay? And essentially, the bigger thing is, is it's your state boards, once you get into medical school, pretty much will be the determiner on what kind of doctor you end up being, okay? More so than your MCAT score. MCAT is going to do nothing but get you into medical school, okay? So as we're finishing up, um, these are pretty much all of the Ohio schools that we have. Um, so the forms that are up here, they will have um, the Ohio school, well, no, not these. Um, but usually, if you want to know the schools, um, you can come see us for all the Ohio schools. We usually tell students, um, apply to all the Ohio schools because you get precedence, all right, because you're an Ohio resident, all right? This is pretty much stats. Um, we're going with MCAT. Um, so the bigger picture that I want students to understand here is, if you look up and it says biological sciences, you know, you've got about... Uh, 28, 29,000 students who are applying that are biology majors and maybe 50% of them end up getting in. And so if you're going to be a biology major, you better be a good biology major. You know, that's what I say on it. You know, and make your secret sauce look good, you know. But if you look down where you got social sciences, 
Yeah, we have some students. Not as many, five, six thousand apply. Social sciences, anthropology, sociology, psychology, those kind of things, but they're getting in at a higher rate. Okay. And so I just say be very mindful, and it goes back to picking that major, okay, that's going to be most conducive to you. All right? This is pretty much the breakdown of the MCAT now with the four sections since they've added the psychology and sociology. This is the score curve, so it runs from 472 to 526. Usually we tell students if you get a 500 or higher, you should be good, okay? And so there is a big difference. If you get a 499, 499 on the MCAT, that usually puts you some down, somewhere down in the lower 40th percentile with a 499. One point to a 500, Put you either high to low 50th percentile. So one point will do that. Okay. This is what's going to be the breakdown of it. So they'll give you a composite score for each of the sections and then they'll tell you what your main score will be. Okay. So how we prepare and what we need to be doing now. So we're already doing the classwork. That's not the issue. All right. What we need to be doing now is either trying to get certified in doing something, or we need to start shadowing and volunteering, okay? Those are the things that you need to start doing now. And if it's nothing but a straight cold call to your family physician, do you have any PAs on staff I can shadow? Uh, do you have any MDs or DOs that I shadow? Do you have any PTs I can shadow? That's how that starts. Our PT students, if you guys need shadowing hours, you can go over to uh, Wright State Physicians, right in the back of campus, okay? They'll give you 40-hour blocks to shadow, all right? For our MD students, we've got um, different places that you can go shadow. You have to come to the office and come see me in order to get that information. Okay. So these are the things that you should be doing so then when that third year spring semester comes around, we're not sitting there looking shocked like, oh, I don't have any shadowing done, and I'm getting ready to apply in two months. You know, that's hard, that's stressful, okay? So these are the things, you know, study abroad. Think about a gap year. What are you rushing for? Just like it's in, in, in when you were in high school, think about it. Y'all had senioritis, right? You couldn't wait to get out. The same thing has happened here. By the time you get close to your senior year, you're like, I can get out of here. I'm ready to go. Okay? So if, if you're feeling that way, then why would you then want to rush right in, okay, without being at least 100% as prepared as you could be to go into the next stage of your life, to do the profession you want to be when you grow up? You know, take that gap year. Take time to shadow. Take time to study abroad. Take time to go meet those doctors so they can write nice letters for you. But you're rushing to get away from here to go into something way harder. And if you're not prepared, you're going to crash and burn. Okay? Yes, sir. I uh, was just curious for shadowing. Mm -hmm. uh, is is it kind of good practice to have like consistent shadowing? Say like we shadow freshman year, and we had pretty good hours. But you know, should we keep doing that? The more the better. I mean, think of, think think of it this way. Okay, not not to say that you know if you don't get that 200 hours that you're just not going to make it in, or you know, because I just told you that a young lady barely did in and got in. Okay. It's more of the more that you put yourself out there and you participate in that, the more you know about the field. The more then you can make an educated uh, um, determination as to where do you want to go, what do you want to do. You know, a lot of times it's more important to find out what you don't like to do, okay, more so than finding out what you like to do. Because nine times out of ten, the things you don't like to do are usually what you end up doing because you think it's easier, okay? And so if you guys say that you want to be in health professions, do that. You use the resources that you have. The people who are very successful in getting in, nine times out of 10, are the people who use their resources. They're the ones that go to tutoring, they're the ones that come see their advisor, both their academic advisor and the pre-health advisor. Those are the people who are successful on a more consistent basis than everyone else, okay? So just consistency um, in the fall, we have a mock interview workshop where we bring a um, health profession panel and you're able to interview for 20 minutes in front of the panel and then you get 10 minutes feedback as to what you can do to kind of help you. Um, so usually students who are getting ready to interview um, usually find that very helpful. 
Um, so that's something. Um, our letter writing services. So with our letters, um, and this is really going to pertain just to our pre-meds and our dentistry students. We have a letter writing service where the letters of recommendation that you receive, we will collect them for you, we will read over them for you, um, and then we usually write a cover letter um, to talk about um, the nice things that your evaluators are saying about you. Okay? Um, these are the forms that are here at the front. Um, the forms essentially are very easy. The top part is going to be how you know the individual that's going to be writing the letter for you. Okay? The middle part is going to be a rubric that they write about you Okay, to say, oh, they're awesome, they're this, they're that. So then that makes it a little bit easier for us to add some adjectives into your cover letter. And then the bottom section is the deadline as to when you want your letters of recommendation to start coming into the office. So usually I tell students, sometime around April, you want to start getting your letters. Now, you can do this yourself. Okay, but what I will say, especially for that dentistry and that medical application, it's stressful. And you've got a lot of things you need to do. And letters of recommendation are like trying to herd cats. Okay? And it's extremely hard. And so, if this is something that you want to do, we're very happy to do it. But I can't do this if I don't know you. Okay? I'm starting to get letters from students that I have never seen. So how am I supposed to write a letter of recommendation, or at least a cover letter, if I don't know you? Okay? So again, I'm in 106 Ullman. Please come see me. Let's talk about your plan and your journey. Okay? Because that's what it is. Everybody's journey and plan is different. Okay? But again, this comes back to use your resources that you have. All right? So if you do, if you're applying to medical school or thinking about it, I have a form here. If you're doing dentistry, I have a form here. I have the schedule for the impact. So um, even though it's going to be for 2017, it kind of gives you an idea of when they're going to be offering the MCAT exams because they don't offer maybe two or three a month, if that, and two or three months out of the year, they don't even offer MCAT exams. GRE is different. You can take a GRE almost any day. Okay. Um, so we have that. Um, here is uh, the prereqs, so any of the uh, health professions that you are interested in, um, you can come and get the information on the prereqs that's needed. And again, this is the flyer for health professions for our young sisters and brothers. And then my business card and information to come see me and email me. Okay? So if you need anything, that's what we are here for. Um, we want to do nothing but make you the doctors of the future. Okay? I'm going to have to come see you. So I don't want no C pluses and nobody who I haven't met. Okay? So please come use your resources. That's what we're here for. Okay? Any, any other questions? Don't let me get ready to walk out and then you want to form a line. Okay, yes ma'am. I was just curious. Out of those like 5,000 applicants, do you have any idea how many people actually got interviews? Usually interviews is about half. Okay. So usually what they'll do is, um, However many come in, traditionally it'll be 50% of that. And then um, once the interviews happen, everything starts 50% after that, that they start cutting it down. And then they'll kind of group students together, you know, 4.0 GPAs, high impacts are kind of here, interviewing first, then the next level, then the next level kind of thing. Okay. okay? Um, for the students who are maybe interested in going over to Boonshoft, um, to get a secondary application towards interview, um, there's a 3.0 GPA minimum that you need and at least a minimum of 495 for your MCAT score. Okay? Any other questions? Yes? When you send the, um, the letters of recommendation, you attach all the letters with the cover letter? or just Correct. So all your letters, I attach them, I submit them. Um, a lot of times, I'll be honest, there's been some students who didn't get into medical school because their letters sucked. Um, you know, like I said, when I initially told you, um, it's an exclusive club, right? And so um, if your letters, and it'll say on here, your letters need to be generic to whom they concern, it needs to be on some type of professional letterhead, and it needs to have a signature, okay? There, I've seen letters that come through and it's just been typed on nothing, a name. It looked like the students could have typed it themselves. And unfortunately, people will be dishonest. And so these are the little bitty nuances that you wouldn't necessarily know. You know, that could keep you out. And you're like, I'm 
perfect. I've got the GPA and I've done everything and I've done shadow like she told me to. Why didn't I get in? Because your letter sucked. It looked unprofessional. And if this is an exclusive club that they're trying to bring you into, then they're going to dock you for that exclusive mistake. Okay? So, any other? Yes. Uh, just uh, about the letters that we asked for. Mm -hmm. If, like, say either our, because you need one for, if you do research, right? You need one for a research professor you I mean, you, you, you always want to pick people who want to talk about you in the best light. So if that person, your research PI, um, knows you, knows your work ethic, um, you know, can speak on your grades and those kind of things, then that's the kind of stuff that you want, that's the kind of person that you want to write a letter. But it doesn't have to be that person. Okay. It can be anybody, friends and family. Okay, non, I'm sorry, non-friends or family. Okay, like I said, you at least want your professional, that the health profession you want to go into, your science professors, because they're looking at your science courses, all right, and then somebody else who can talk nice things about you, good things. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and for pertaining to the letters as well, um, is it like, would it benefit us if we had more health professionals that in the, what we wanted to go into, writing letters, like? Yes, advice? always. Like, it's there's always. no limit on to how many. Well, okay, so there is a limit. So medical schools usually, limit is 10. Um, I usually tell students get five or six, then you can kind of pick and choose who has some awesome letters, who has some kind of not so awesome. Um, and then um, for all of the other health professions, they usually want between three and five. So that's why I say normally um, it's the profession you want to be in, the science professor. Um, a lot of times you can also do a non-science professor, um, and then. Uh, anyone at that point, a supervisor, if you're in a fraternity or sorority, any of those kind of things um, that can talk about your character and that kind of thing. Any other questions? I'm going to take a time Nothing else? I've got my business card, so hopefully the other ones that I already see, my babies, you'll tell the other ones here to come see me, okay? Please do. That's what I'm here for, okay? All right, well, thank you. Appreciate it.